This segment follows directly on the preceding one. The subject is Gaussian mixture models, or GMMs, and I want to give you a couple of examples of what GMMs look like in two dimensions or higher. The usefulness of GMMs in particular is probably in the range of dimensions 2 to maybe 5 or maybe 8, something like that. GMMs are not going to work in 100 or 1,000 dimensional space. But let's do two dimensions because then we can plot the results and see how they work. We're going to do this in MATLAB, except that MATLAB doesn't have a GMM routine. The MATLAB statistical toolbox does have one, but actually I'm partial, as you might expect, to the numerical recipes third edition implementation, which is called GMM. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to build its functionality into MATLAB by using a MATLAB so-called MEX function, as you see here. But let's look at what functionality I want. I want to be able to construct a GMM within MATLAB, and what do I have to be given? I have to be given simply a matrix of data, that is to say each line in this matrix is a point in m-dimensional space, and the number of rows is the number of points, and then I need a starting position a location of the means of a certain number of Gaussian components that I want to try to fit. And if we just put those in a matrix and call it means, we can let MATLAB figure out how many components we want by simply how many rows there are in that matrix. Then I want to tell MATLAB to run the GMM model to take a certain number of EM steps. Um, which I'll specify here, and return a log likelihood for the model. That's something which is supposed to increase with the number of steps that I take. When I'm done and I've decided that I've converged to as big a likelihood as I'm going to get, I want to return the mean and covariance matrices of each of the Gaussian components. So here I'm going to do it one at a time to return a vector and a matrix of the kth component in the model. And then if I want to know the assignment of each individual point to a Gaussian component, I want to know the response matrix, and here's a call I'm going to build in for that. Finally, because you're going to see that when you do this kind of thing with MEX functions in MATLAB, you can leave garbage behind. You want a cleanup function here to delete anything around. Well, I'm not going to go through the MEX function in any detail other than to point out to you that you really should learn how to write MEX functions if you program in MATLAB and in any lower level language like C or C++. But basically you call something that tells the number of arguments on the left hand side, the number of arguments on the right hand side, and then it gives you arrays of pointers to those arguments. So it's your responsibility within the MEX function to sort out what the possible arguments are in number, and in this case we've given string arguments to be able to tell what the command is. So you sort that all out and then do whatever it is you want to do and then return your answers through these pointers on the left hand side. The key step is down here where we're implementing the construct function and the key statement here is simply this line which instantiates a class from numerical recipes third edition Gauss mix mod and assigns it to a pointer GMM. And then that pointer persists throughout the various MATLAB calls that I might make on this model. So the key point in MATLAB MEX functions is that if you instantiate pointers within them, they remain in memory until you explicitly delete them. OK, that's probably more than you really needed to know about MEX functions. Let's just see what our Gaussian mixture models do. I want to first do an ideal example in which everything is just arranged so that the Gaussian mixture model has just got to succeed in a pretty much unique way. And the way to do that is to build this data set that actually is a mixture of Gaussians. So here I'm going to generate a synthetic data set of 3,000 data points, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to define in two dimensions the location of the center of one of these Gaussians, 0.3.3. If I follow this arrow, I see it's right here. And then I'm going to 
define a covariance matrix, in other words, what shape that Gaussian is around its center, and I've picked the values here, which result in, as you can see, a kind of a lopsided shape at a 45 degree angle. Similarly, I'm going to define a second Gaussian. It's the one that has this wide distribution of points centered right here. And you can see that its covariance matrix is diagonal and with a fairly large variance on the diagonals here, 0.5 and 0.5. The third component is the one over here, which is this sort of tall, skinny one, and that's defined by this mean and this covariance matrix. So now I simply create a sample which is multivariate normal random sampled a thousand points from each of these three distributions. And that's going to be my synthetic data. Now the question is, given just those points, can a Gaussian mixture model recover what the original Gaussians were? So here's what it looks like using our MEX function. We construct the GMM, and now we loop, um, looking for a step in the log likelihood which is less than 0 0.1. When this less than 0 0.1, we'll decide in this simple example that that's converged enough for us. Probably in real life you want a smaller number like this, maybe 0 0.01 or 1 1,000th, something like that. I'm going to take a step only once each time in each call, one step, um, and that's just so that I can plot the error ellipses of the various components, in other words, the way of visualizing what the Gaussian is. Do you remember our error ellipse function? We developed that in a very early segment in the series, and now we're going to use it. So here's the results. I love the way this picture looks. It somehow seems very artistic to me. We're plotting the first error ellipses only after there's already been one iteration of the EM method. And by that time, it's already gotten to sort of reasonable ellipses. It's the outer ones here, which is its approximation of the big component. Then I guess there's an one here outside, which is approximating this inner component. And then on this third one, it sort of started off guessing wrong. It started off guessing something like this, probably because it was centered on a point that actually came from that first, or I should say from the second, the broadest distribution. But then as we iterate, it quickly figures out that it wants to be shaped this way. And so the inner ellipses, now I should say the ellipses near the concentration of ellipses in each of these are what the final answer is. And here just for clarity, I've plotted the same plot showing the final ellipses that it converges to. So you can see that in this ideal example, we rapidly converge to the right answer. And in fact, given enough data points, it would converge with arbitrary accuracy to those Gaussians, because that really is the correct statistical model for which we're maximizing the likelihood. But now let's try a non-ideal example, something that isn't really a sum of Gaussian distributions. So for that example, I'm going to go back to this distribution that we've seen before. This is the distribution from the human genome of the lengths, or the log base 10 lengths, of the first and second exons within each gene. And you'll recall we pointed out a little bit of biology in here in an earlier segment. We pointed that there's a pretty hard lower limit to the length that an exon wants to be, although there are rare exceptions, as you see here in this scattering of dots here. But then when you're above that limit, you do have some kind of a distribution here that we might think is Gaussian or could be represented as a bivariate Gaussian. Let's see what the GMM model does when we apply it to this data set. This code, you don't have to read it all. This is just the code to dredge these numbers out of the file that they're buried in and put it in a data set suitable for our GMM function. So here's the answer with three components. You can see that the code is very similar to the code that we just saw. Um, we define starting points for the means of the components by simply picking random points within the sample. So here uh, we pick 
For three components, we pick three random points and assign their location to the starting means. We construct the Gaussian mixture model here. And then here, we iterate until the change in delta log, in, the change in log likelihood is less than a tenth. And finally, plot the resulting distribution. This is what we get. You can see that there's a kind of a logic to it, namely, it figured out that it needs a broad Gaussian to include the outlier points, and then it basically tried to approximate everything in here as a couple of overlapping Gaussians. Why did it do it in this way? It does it overlapping because it needs to try to make sharper edges here and here than it could make with any single Gaussian. Anyway, um, that might be imputing too much intelligence to it. It simply does what it has to do to maximize the likelihood function. In fact, this isn't even a unique answer with three components. Here I'm going to show you the results for trying different starting values, in other words, choosing a different random three points for the starting means of the three components. And what I did find is that there are only a handful of possible ways that this can come out. So for example, this one here in the lower left is to my eyes pretty much identical to this one here. Um, this is the one that we saw previously and it's a little bit different but not very different from this one over here. Whereas this one it seems to have done something uh, a little bit different it seems to have taken a bigger component to fit most of the uh, points up here and then a little interior component to increase the intensity here. Now I didn't bother printing out what the log likelihoods are of these six pictures. There will be one which has a larger log likelihood therefore is ostensibly more likely than the other ones. But I didn't print them out because you basically shouldn't pay too much attention to them. It's clear that the data is just not the sum of three Gaussians. And so by asking what is the global absolute maximum likelihood of a model that is the sum of three Gaussians, that's not really the right question. The right question is probably a much more practical one. If I want to represent this data as a sum of Gaussians, are any of these fits tolerably good? And to get fits that are better, we can add components. So here are examples that come out of this data set if you fit eight Gaussian components. Now there's quite a lot of non-uniqueness depending on starting point and what you're going to get. But you can see that there are some interesting themes. So in this one down here in the lower left, you can see that it fits the outlier points mostly with just these two Gaussians here. And then it simply just finds some set of overlapping Gaussians that do the best job of fitting the data in here, hard edges and all. And you can see that it has a tendency, for example, to put a single narrow Gaussian here to kind of beef, beef up the sharpness of the edge. Or here's one that's put on the left, or this one here to beef up the sharpness on the left. So the results here that have higher likelihood are pretty good as summaries of the data distribution, but not as individual components. If you take them and add them together in the proportions given by the Gaussian mixture model, that will be a distribution that if you sample from it, you'll get back some reasonable facsimile of what the actual data is. The moral of the story, and something that people who successfully use GMMs all agree with, is this little rule of thumb. It's fit a lot of Gaussians for interpolation to create a simple representation of your complicated data in multi-dimensions. But don't believe the individual components as signifying anything physical. Now on my last slide here I want to tell you something about simplifications of Gaussian mixture models. The main opportunity for simplification is in the covariance matrices because that's the big 
number the majority of fitted parameters in the model. After all, each Gaussian component has only a vector of length m to tell where its mean is, but it has an m by m matrix that's describing the covariance matrix. So what if we don't need all that complexity? Well, a first level of simplification is that you could constrain the covariance matrices to all be diagonal. What does that mean, diagonal? That means that there would be no cross-correlations. That means that the ellipses would line up with the axes in your problem. So that doesn't make any sense if your axes are like a three-dimensional real space with rotational invariance, but that might be a reasonable simplification if your axes represent quantities with just very different character and you're willing to simplify so that each one just has its own variance. Well, how do you do that? The only thing you have to change in the code is the step where you re-estimate the covariance matrix. And now we're only going to re-estimate it on diagonal components. We're going to set the off-diagonal components to zero. And in each of those diagonal components, that is to say in each dimension, we're simply going to estimate it as the weighted variance in that dimension, that is to say the value of the point minus the mean of that component, but only the mth component. And then it's a weighted average weighted by the assignments of the points to that component. A further simplification would be to constrain the covariance matrices to simply be multiples of the unit matrix. That's a simplification that says that each Gaussian is simply a symmetric ball around the location of its mean. And a symmetric ball has a covariance matrix which is not just diagonal, it has the same value for each of its diagonal components. And that value is simply this. It's the mean square distance of the points from their mean from the mean position of that component. So we take the vector modulus here and take the weighted average of that over the assignment of the points. So this thing is just a number and we multiply it by the unit matrix to get the covariance matrix. Finally here's a truly radical simplification. We can simply take the covariance matrix to be the unit matrix but multiplied by some very small number epsilon. Why do I do that? Well, if epsilon is very small, that says that the probability falls off very rapidly as we move away from the mean. And in that case, if you think about it, if there's a point that's being assigned to one cluster or another, one Gaussian component or another, its probabilities will be truly tiny for all of them, but the one that will dominate exponentially is simply the closest cluster. So this is a method that you don't even think about as being a Gaussian mixture model. This is a method that people call k-means clustering. And what it says is you simply choose locations for the centers of the clusters, assign each point to the closest cluster, and now you only re-estimate the mean positions of the clusters. You don't re-estimate any covariance matrix at all because the covariance matrix has really dropped out of the picture entirely in favor of this simple assignment to the closest center. So k-means clustering we see really is a special case of Gaussian mixture models. It's kind of Gaussian mixture models for dummies. It's very widely used. Here I'm going to be a little bit opinionated. It's widely used because there are a lot of dummies. I think that you're probably always better off doing this middle bullet. In other words, allowing there to be a finite covariance, even if you're going to constrain it to be spherical. There's really not much more work in that than doing k-means clustering, and I think that it probably gives better answers more of the time.